Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Green, Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. I wanted to welcome you um, to the Genomics and Health Disparities Lecture Series. I'm just going to give a general introduction about the series, and then I'll turn this over to a colleague to introduce today's speaker. I just want to remind you, um, this is the second lecture in a series we have dedicated to looking at genomics and health disparities. The series is really designed to educate and to encourage conversations about how genomics research and genomic technologies um, can really affect um, health disparities research and uh, opportunities we see going forward in this very important area. And we've deliberately selected speakers um, to who approach the problem of studying health disparities from different perspectives, from genomics research um, with an emphasis, but also making sure we've covered a full spectrum across the research landscape from basic science to population genomics, as well as translational and clinical research. Now, reflecting the broad interest in this area, um, and our institute, NHGRI, has been fortunate to have four co-sponsors uh, to this uh, lecture series, um, the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and also the Office of Minority Health at the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Now, the series started with the first lecture uh, by Dr. Carlos Bustamante, a, a well-known population genomicist from Stanford University, whose research focused on analyzing genome-wide patterns of genomic variation within and between species and how that is used to address fundamental questions in biology, anthropology, and medicine. And today's speaker will very nicely complement what we heard from Carlos and I think, again, in many ways set up um, some of the issues and uh, problems we'll be hearing about in subsequent um, uh, lectures. So to introduce today's speaker, I'd like to uh, turn the podium over to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Griff Rogers, who's the director of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Griff. Well, thanks, Eric, and I, I'm certainly pleased uh, to be here, and I want to welcome you uh, to, this, uh, to this lectureship uh, series. It certainly gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce my good friend and, and colleague uh, to be a part of this uh, session, uh, Dr. Neil Pohl. Dr. Pohl uh, earned his um, medical degree at Harvard's Medical School and his master's in public health at the Harvard School of uh, Public Health. He subsequently uh, went on to the University of Pennsylvania, where he completed his residency and a Robert Wood Johnson uh, clinical scholar, and during that period of time received an MBA degree uh, at the Wharton School at Penn. And after spending many years at, at Johns Hopkins, where he was the head of the, of the Welch uh, Center, Dr. Poe moved to San Francisco, uh, where, as you can see, he is the chief of medicine at the Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital. That's important to point out. He's also the Constance uh, uh, B. Wolfe, a distinguished professor and vice chair of medicine at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Poe's uh, research uh, unites medicine and public health uh, with the goals of saving and improving uh, the quality of human lives. And his major interest have been in improving uh, discovery, education, and clinical practice of medicine, uh, propelling academic organizations to function effectively and efficiently, uh, and developing uh, future talents and leadership uh, in the health profession. Uh, and this is actually where uh, we work uh, very closely together in the uh, current uh, Harold Amos uh, Medical Faculty Development Program, the erstwhile Robert Wood Johnson uh, med uh, minority Medical Faculty Program, where I've worked with Neil for going on 20 years now. Uh, Dr. Poe is a remarkably creative and innovative thinker uh, in the area of kidney disease and public health, looking at many different factors, including the role of race and gender uh, in treatment settings. One of uh, a recent paper, a JAMA paper, that he published entitled, Why Don't Physicians Follow Clinical Practice Guidelines? Uh, it's a framework for improvement um, uh, that he published uh, in 1999, has over 3,000 uh, citations. In addition, Dr. Poe was uh, part of a team that discovered the genetic variant on chromosome 22 that confers a significant risk 
of kidney disease and is found exclusively in individuals of African origin. Uh, he continues to study this ApoL1 gene uh, and its role in ESRD or end stage renal disease uh, in health disparities. Dr. Poe has been a recipient of numerous uh, NIH grants and has received many honors and awards. Just to name a few, he's a member of the, uh, the uh, National Academy of, of Medicine, the erstwhile IOM. He's a master of the American College of Physicians. He's received the Diversity Award from the Association of Professors of Medicine, the John M. Eisenberg Award uh, for Career Achievement Research uh, from the Society of General Internal Medicine, uh, and the Belding Scribner Award from the American Society of Nephrology. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Green, mentioned that at least uh, at the uh, NIH, uh, the, uh, this series is um, co-sponsored by four institutes, and I'm pleased to say that all four institute directors are here present uh, at, uh, at, your, at your talk. So without uh, further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Poe for this lecture. Thank, thank you, Griff. Um, it's always nice when you, you've known somebody for 40, over 40 years, and they can give that kind of introduction to you. And I, I'm really glad he said the things I'm most proud of and didn't say the things that <laughs> I'm not most proud of. <laughs> so thank you, Griff. And I thank, thank everybody for attending. I want to thank the Institute directors for, uh, for, for sponsoring uh, this uh, uh, session. Um, and um, I, this is one of the first times I've been able to show this slide, um, you know, with the Zuckerberg San Francisco General, as we're now uh, known due to a generous uh, donation, the largest, generation, uh, largest donation to a uh, public hospital uh, in the country. Um, so um, what, what I'm going to talk about is uh, my, one of my favorite subjects, and that is disparities from the viewpoint of chronic kidney disease. So I'm going to start with a case illustrating uh, racial and ethnic disparities in kidney disease. And then I'm going to uh, put forth a premise about disparities as a focal point in science and medicine. Uh, talk about definitions and a framework for how I try to understand disparities. And uh, talk a little through the, the lens of my research on the science of uh, disparities of why kidney disease occurs more often uh, in uh, minorities. Then hopefully we'll have, may have some time for questions uh, at the end. So uh, let me start with a case. This is a, a common occurrence, a 46-year-old African-American male who presents to the emergency room for generalized weakness, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, his history of present illness is he had increased lower extremity edema for two months. He was seen by a private physician, uh, a physician who cared for his mother. There was no lab work done, but he was placed on a uh, diuretic. His edema improved, but he, worsening weakness and a 15-pound weight loss over two months. And then he presented to the emergency room with nausea and vomiting of three days duration. In his past medical history, he had no history of kidney disease or other uh, uh, chronic diseases. Uh, he did have a family history of diabetes and hypertension, and he took uh, no uh, medications, including over-the-counter medications. On physical exam, he was chronically uh, ill-appearing, young man in no acute distress. His vital signs were normal, notably his blood pressure was 141 over 76. And his exam was really unremarkable, but his laboratory examination was uh, re remarkable uh, in that he had a bicarbonate of 19, a anion gap of 28, uh, calcium of 5.8, phosphorus of 13, and a high BUN and creatinine 240 and 28. And so he was admitted and seen by the nephrology service and a temporary catheter was placed and he was immediately started on hemodialysis. So what this case illustrates is an African-American patient with kidney failure, uh, not uncommon, a late presentation for care, where there's little opportunity to prepare for kidney failure, an urgent initiation of hemodialysis, 
uh, probably limiting optimal uh, treatment uh, for end-stage renal disease. So this is, this is my premise, that science on disparities, clinical care with diverse patients, and education about disparities enhances all of medicine and human health. And why? It's because learning about disparities allows the examination of complex interactions that contribute, often unequally, for different clinical problems to human health. So interactions between biology and the environment, between environment and social conditions, between biology and social uh, con conditions. And so examining disparities allows us to look um, at a variety of, uh, of different determinants of disease. Now, I'd, like to, I'd like to show this slide about the racial and ethnic composition of the United States of California and then the hospital that I uh, practice at. In the U.S. now, uh, uh, pro uh, minorities uh, make up about 31% uh, of the population. Uh, and if you look at projections uh, in, in um, 2050, uh, minorities are projected to make up, uh, be, be a majority of the population. We passed that in California in 2005, where uh, minorities make up a, a large portion of the population, and that's even larger in the city that, uh, that I uh, practice, live in San Francisco. And then if you uh, look at uh, the population at my uh, county hospital uh, that serves the underserved, uh, in fact, we, we have a very diverse ethnic group, almost 20 to 30 percent of, of the population in different ethnic um, groups. And so we do a lot of, uh, we do clinical care, we do education, uh, to, to students and residents, uh, and we do a tremendous amount of research on uh, our diverse and vulnerable populations. So last year was a year of anniversaries. On December 1st, uh, 1955, that was the year that I was born. I shouldn't tell my age and Griff's age, too, since I've known him for, well, Rosa Parks changed the course of history and inspired um, all of us by the steps that she took when she uh, uh, came in a bus. But it was also another year of anniversaries. In September of 1985, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services issued the landmark uh, Heckler Report. And I remember this because I was a fellow at that time, and it was, it was an amazing report because for the, I think for the first time it documented health disparities in the United States among racial and ethnic minorities. And it said disparities are an affront both to our ideals and to the ongoing genius of American medicine. And so this report served as a driving force for ending health disparities and advancing health equity in America. There was very little disparities research uh, before this report uh, w was issued, I think, going on in the whole country. So disparities, what do we mean by disparities? Disparity is a difference or a lack of equality. And the Institute of Medicine said that healthcare should not only be safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, and efficient, but also equitable, that is providing care that does not vary in quality because of personal characteristics as gender, ethnicity, geographic location, or socioeconomic status. And race, I know this is an emotionally charged uh, term in our society, nowhere else in the world is, is ra are we preoccupied with race. And the different, these are different definitions of race. Webster's defines race as a group of people united or classified together on the basis of common history, nationality, or geographic distribution. And the Institute of Medicine defined race as a construct of human variability based on perceived, perceived differences in biology, physical appearance, and behavior, not a biologic reality. And then I like Mike Bamshad's uh, uh, definition of both that, that about information about genetic group membership captured by notions of race 
is in general less than that obtained by making inferences of ancestry from geographic or explicit genetic data. And this schematic shows what, uh, what the thinking is on this, showing uh, genetic relatedness among different uh, ethnic groups. And I think, uh, uh, you know, showing that in fact we all are, are make up of different uh, ancestry, whether that's African American, European, or Asian ancestry. And what's really remarkable is that the genetic distance uh, between, in, uh, between individuals within the same population is larger than the genetic dif distance between individuals from different populations. So we, we are really all one uh, and the same. So um, since um, the Heckler Report, there, there's really been a, a plethora of data that has shown that there's non-uniformity of health among racial and ethnic groups uh, in the United States. Uh, if you look at life expectancy, the differences are about a 10-year gap for, for uh, black men versus whites, five years different for women. The infant mortality rate is higher for blacks and Native Americans. Uh, the death rate is, harder, is, is higher for a variety of diseases uh, for blacks and Hispanics uh, compared to whites. And uh, for most uh, ethnic minorities, they, they have higher rates of kidney failure, as I'll talk about, and also many other diseases. And these disparities persist even after accounting for socioeconomic status, for insurance, lifestyle factors, and clinical factors. And, I was, and I'll show you some of the evidence where chronic kidney disease. And the toll is really that uh, shown in this article by uh, my former colleague Tom Levis and, and Daryl Gaskins, that the combined cost of health inequalities and premature death in the United States were one point uh, two four trillion dollars. I always like to say, you know, that could have paid for health care reform. That uh, uh, that that one point two four trillion dollars. Um, and this is a striking article I, that I thought published several years ago um, uh, by Chris Murray, who showed that uh, we live in uh, eight Americas, and he investigated mortality disparities across races and counties and race counties in the United States. And so he looked at, the, at eight Americas, uh, America uh, that at the top uh, where Asians live, where the average income per capita is 21,000, and where 80% of folks uh, uh, completed high school, and then looked at Northland, low-income rural whites, and you can see the average per capita income and percent completing high school. And then, but you go all the way down the list and you see uh, actually Western Native Americans, uh, per capita income, half of that of, of Asians or middle America. Um, and the, the graduation rate from high school, very low. And then uh, blacks in middle America and then blacks in southern low income rural communities, again, 10,000 and 61 percent completing high school. And then high risk urban uh, uh, blacks. Um, and strikingly, he looked at the mortality over many uh, years in these groups, and they're arrayed in the order that I've shown you. But striking that the high, uh, that, that the uh, uh, urban blacks here at the bottom, uh, um, you know, more, t I'm sorry, here at the top, uh, wait, <laughs> no, sorry, at the bottom had a lower uh, life expectancy uh, at birth, and this is true for, you can see this relationship across these eight Americas is, uh, is similar for males as for females, although females having less mortality. So it's looking at the impact, I think, both of, of race and of uh, socioeconomic status uh, in, in America. So let me turn to, uh, kidney failure, an area that I've worked a lot in. Um, and we know that kidney failure, end-stage renal disease, uh, that, uh, that you, uh, needs to be treated with dialysis or transplantation, some form of renal replacement therapy, and if, if you are to live, is up to 2.9 times higher in racial and ethnic 
uh, minorities. This is data from the United States Renal Data System, and it shows that in 2013, uh, the incidence of kidney failure was 825 per million population in African Americans compared to 282 per million population uh, in whites. And the mean onset of end-stage renal disease is about five years earlier, so it strikes minorities earlier. And the rate is higher, you can see, in most uh, minorities. That includes uh, Native Americans and Asians, so not as, not as uh, dramatic as in African Americans, and also higher uh, in Hispanics, and it occurs earlier uh, than uh, in the Caucasian population. So why is this bad? Treating ESRD is costly both personally and financially. Um, a a, a, a age 50 to 54 year old uh, person, their expected uh, remaining lifetime in the general population is 30 years, but if you're a dialysis patient, it's eight years, or a transplant patient, uh, if you're lucky to get one, is 20 years. And the annual Medicare expenditures are, you can see, uh, eight times higher for someone in the, who's a, who ha, is on dialysis than if you're in the general population. And quality of life is, is poor, uh, although if you're lucky to get a transplant, uh, it can restore quality of life uh, compared to the general population. So there's really the need to preempt illness upstream through molecular knowledge, through clinical therapeutics, and through uh, behavioral uh, interventions. Um, and that's what um, I've been trying to do after studying ESRD for many years is to focus on chronic kidney disease. And one of the projects I'm involved in is the uh, CDC uh, surveillance project, uh, CKD surveillance project uh, that's uh, uh, sponsored by the Center for Disease Control where, the, where we track kidney disease in the United States. So one in 10 adults have chronic kidney disease that we've shown from N. Haynes. Over 20 million individuals uh, in the United States have chronic kidney disease. And what we do is we chart uh, statistics for the nation, including for healthy people 2020 on uh, uh, chronic kidney disease prevalence, incidence, awareness, risk factors, health consequences, quality of care, and how well our health system is prepared to care for individuals with chronic kidney disease. So we look at trends, and this shows data from the United States Re Renal Data System funded by the uh, NIDDK on the incidence rate of ESRD by race. And you can see it, there, there, we really thought there was an epidemic in the 1980s and the 1990s, but recently um, it looks as if we've begun to make a difference, and in fact this uh, rate, the rate of ESRD is declining, although it is still dramatically higher in African Americans uh, can, compared uh, to the general population. You can see down here lower. And we recently did some work that we presented to the last American Society of Nephrology, meaning to see if actually the, in, the prevalence of earlier stages of kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, is defined by EG, uh, uh, a um, EG estimated glomerular filtration rate less than 60 or albuminuria, um, its prevalence was declining. And it looks as if actually that it is declining, although there's a concern here in this, shown in the blue line, uh, that in African Americans, that rate of decline has not uh, uh, continued. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things uh, that's interesting is I think we have no or very few therapies today. And I think this slide uh, from the African American kidney disease study, I, I like to illustrate that. And it, it, this was, um, as you know, an NIDDK-funded study of African Americans with kidney uh, disease, early stage kidney disease, and it compared ACE inhibitors to non-ACE inhibitors. And here you see that during the trial, 
In fact, uh, the rate of the endpoint, which was a combined endpoint of ESRD as well as uh, death or doubling of serine creatinine, it was lower in the ACE group uh, than the non-ACE group. Um, but uh, what happened after the trial is you see that uh, uh, more than 50 percent of individuals, despite being on ACE inhibitors, still progress toward the end point, showing that our, our, our therapies are, are really halfway therapies, uh, if, if, at, if at all, and that there is a great need to identify why this happens um, and to develop therapies to prevent this. Um, recently, my uh, colleague Carmen Peralta uh, published a study that, showed, that shows that actually the decline in early stage uh, kidney disease uh, at early ages is faster among African Americans uh, than whites. And this, is, this shows that by age, uh, EGFR and the top line in blacks who have a higher uh, EGF, e, uh, GFR is measured by cystatin. Um, but you see that this rate of decline is much greater in African Americans, the slope here is greater than in uh, whites over uh, with, with aging, suggesting that in fact there is a, a higher rate of progression of disease among African Americans. And a large study was done in uh, Kaiser uh, in uh, Southern California, and a large number of individuals, over a million individuals in Kaiser Permanente, where they follow, they measured actually individuals' uh, uh, kidney function at, at baseline, and then followed them over uh, several years, one, three, and five years. And what they showed is that in um, both African Americans and Hispanics, uh, the odds of uh, progression to kidney failure uh, were higher. Uh, and for blacks, that's true at any entry GFR. Uh, for uh, Hispanics, it was high only for those individuals who had uh, a lower GFR. At, at starting in Asians, even a suggestion of, of rapid progression. So this is what we think now, is that the higher incidence of kidney failure among African Americans appears due to a faster rate of disease progression rather than a greater prevalence of early stage disease, that in fact uh, uh, blacks are more likely to progress through damage and, and kidney failure. And the issue is what are the contributing factors to this acceleration. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that, about how I think uh, the field has dissected these factors. Um, and I try to think of them as susceptibility, initiation, and progression factors that contribute to the excess ESRD incidence. They could be biological, environmental, behavioral, such as lifestyle, or even the quality or adequacy of the medical care that we uh, deliver. Um, so let's talk about biology. Um, uh, observations were, were made by uh, individual, uh, by, by investigators in the South and Southeast United States. And they, they went in to dialysis units and asked um, 26,000 individuals who were starting dialysis in the Southeast United States, do you have a first or second degree relative who was also being treated for ESRD. And they found that actually 22%, 23% of the individuals in dialysis units had a first or second degree relative. Huge, really, really huge, almost uh, one in four. But that this was much more striking among African Americans than among whites. And this was replicated in about 12 thousand U.S. residents from uh, a larger number of states. Um, and in fact, the rate was higher uh, um, among uh, African Americans than uh, um, among whites, although not as dramatic in this earlier study. 
So that raised the issue of, of um, genetic factors. Um, and uh, several years ago, in it was 1995, um, we started a study called the Choices for Healthy Outcomes and Caring for ESRD study. And it was a national prospective cohort study comparing the effectiveness of hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. We had set this up to look at treatment. But we recruited an interesting population of 1,000 new onset, probably the first study of new onset or incident in adult ESRD patients uh, throughout clinics uh, in the United States. And we followed them for up to nine years. Um, this has been a, a, a great study that um, we've had multiple grants and has supported uh, a lot of individuals' uh, careers. And my colleague, Joe Korish at, at uh, Johns Hopkins, had the wisdom in 1995, when we got this study started, to, to set up a specimen bank uh, far before this was popular. And, um, and, and so we did measurements of serum and plasma and uh, DNA uh, at multiple time points uh, during uh, the follow-up of these uh, patients. And this has allowed, this allowed us to address a variety of factors. You can see in the CHOICE study we've looked at risk factors for pre prevention, diagnosis, uh, etiology, and genetics. That's what I'm going to talk about, the work that Griff referred to in therapy, prognosis, CKD complications, access to care quality and even resource use uh, and cost. Um, and so this is a study that my uh, late colleague, Linda Cal, and um, also Roland Parekh, who's in Canada now, uh, uh, did on, in the Family Investigation of Nephropathy and Diabetes uh, Research Group, but using data from CHOICE. They did a case control design uh, to look at associations of genetic markers with uh, kidney disease and found that MYH9 uh, locus was associated with non-diabetic end-stage renal disease in African Americans. But as Griff said, said, he actually was wrong. We got it wrong. And in fact, um, a variety of other studies uh, emerged, also looking at MYH9, looking not only at non-diabetic kidney disease, but uh, uh, focal uh, segmental glomerular sclerosis, um, HIV-associated nephropathy, as well as hypertensive nephropathy, showing this association with MYH9. But I think more importantly, uh, uh, APOL1, because what we found out is that um, the real culprit was the APOL1 uh, uh, gene that uh, is a, a 14.5 kilobase gene on chromosome 22, but it's located downstream of MYH9. In fact, was in linkage disequilibrium uh, with MYH9 and encodes for a product that's 398 amino acids. And the, the mutant form, or the mutant alleles, actually confer a survival advantage against uh, uh, sleeping sickness, trypanosomiasis. Um, but they also uh, infer a, a risk of increased risk for non-diabetic kidney disease. The mechanism uh, we don't understand, although there are number of potential uh, candidates out there. And this is the structure of the product of APOL1. It's a 43 kilodalton protein, the apolipoprotein uh, uh, family. It's bound to circulating HDL particles. And what's interesting, it's expressed in various organs, including kidney uh, podocytes, uh, renal tubular cells, and glomerular endothelial cells. And it's involved in the autophagy uh, uh, pathway. Um, what's in, even interesting, if you look at where these mutant alleles are uh, uh, in the population in Africa, there's not a quite one-to-one -one overlap, but it suggests that, in fact, the area where the uh, setsi fly, the, the vector uh, for 
uh, sleeping sickness uh, is, is most prevalent, uh, suggesting that there, is th this, there was this select, uh, selection uh, factor for this uh, mutant allele. Um, and so uh, other studies funded by NIDK, the Crick study have, and the AST study have shown uh, that uh, the, the powerful effect of the APOL1 mutant alleles and CKD progression in longitudinal studies following up from the case control studies, uh, rapid case control studies that were done showing that two copies, um, not one, but two copies of the mutant alleles uh, uh, confers uh, risk. Um, and this is true whether individuals uh, have uh, proteinuria or don't have proteinuria, a potent risk factor for progression of a kidney disease. So um, I'll come back to that uh, APOL1 uh, in a minute, but let's talk about environmental factors. Um, could they contribute? Um, Several years ago, um, it was asked uh, by Raynard Kington to get involved in a study in Baltimore funded by the National Institute of Aging called the Healthy Aging in Neighborhoods of Diversity Across the Lifespan. And we designed a study uh, that uh, went into neighborhoods in Baltimore where we could recruit uh, both whites and African Americans, but, but interesting, African Americans of higher socioeconomic status uh, and white Americans of lower socioeconomic states in equal proportions to allow us to try to tease out the effects of biology and uh, socioeconomic status and race. And my colleague uh, at Hopkins, Deidre Cruz, did this study um, that showed that individuals uh, who had lower socioeconomic status uh, were more likely to have chronic kidney disease than those with higher socioeconomic status. But this was really profound for African Americans uh, than uh, uh, for whites. Um, and so, um, you know, shows that there's also a powerful effect of socioeconomic uh, uh, stat, status, something that, uh, that Paul Kimmel, I know saw Paul here, has studied <laughs> uh, tremendously and uh, cares a lot about. But there's also um, behavioral factors. And we did this study uh, several years ago. Actually, um, Paul Eggers uh, had a lot to do with this study because he worked at the then CMS and allowed us to link the NHANE survey with the Medicare registry to provide a longitudinal look at individuals of whether they progress to uh, kidney disease. And so we did this study looking at uh, 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 race. And, uh, and what this shows is the relative risk for blacks versus whites in progression of kidney disease. And if you control for age and sex, there was a uh, almost threefold higher risk. But if you control for SES, you could explain uh, about 12% of the excess risk. And then if you controlled for other lifestyle factors like physical activity, uh, BMI, uh, alcohol and smoking status, you could uh, explain about a quarter of the risk. So in fact, uh, not only uh, socioeconomic status, but lifestyle factors uh, I influence the uh, progression of kidney disease. Um, and recently, uh, we did, we, we used this kind of linkage study, uh, linking again uh, the NHANE study uh, with the ESRD registry, and where we um, looked at the exposure of dietary acid load determined by a 24-hour dietary recall questionnaire. And we measured NHANE participants, whether they developed ESRD over 14 years of follow-up. Uh, and we had a variety of data to control for potential confounders. Uh, and I know this slide is busy, but I, wanna, I just wanna illustrate and tell you what it shows. It shows that um, those who have a high net acid excretion or a high dietary load of uh, high dietary acid load, blacks are much more likely than whites to have a high 
asset load, Mexican Americans as well. And those who um, uh, are in poverty, uh, uh, this is the poverty income ratio, also have a high dietary asset load. That high dietary asset load is, is a diet that is not high in fruits and vegetables, but more in animal products. And it's also true that those of lower socioeconomics, that's less than a high school education, had a higher dietary uh, asset uh, uh, load. But in linking this to, let me see, to the ESRD registry, this is what we found, that actually having a high dietary asset load was associated, this is a cumulative probability of ESRD. Uh, versus a low dietary asset load. So in fact, um, uh, both uh, behavioral factors, including diet, may be a uh, important risk factor uh, for disease. Well, what about the quality and adequacy of CKD care? Uh, one thing is we know that uh, having control of blood pressure helps to prevent uh, progression. And so this is a slide from Ann Haynes uh, in a study that we did looking at minorities in the U.S. with chronic kidney disease. And this shows the percentage of participants with uncontrolled blood pressure. And you can see that compared to whites, um, uh, African Americans uh, shown here, either with CKD or without CKD, um, have higher levels of uncontrolled blood pressure. And this, is, this just makes it more dramatic if you use a stricter definition of blood pressure uh, control, which some argue for in chronic uh, kidney uh, disease. So in fact, how we treat individuals may also contribute uh, to uh, progression. So uh, back to this slide, then if you look at care quality as measured uh, by control of diabetes, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular history, or cholesterol, you can explain about a 33% of the excess risk reduction in, in the study that I showed you before. If you put all those factors together, we could explain over half of the excess risk, but there's still le a, a considerable amount of risk that, that is still there. And maybe is that APOL1 or other genes? Could we have, if we had had data back then uh, about APOL1 in this study, um, could, could we have explained 100%? So these are some questions to ponder. How does APO, how much does APOL1 or other genes contribute to the disparity in ESRD incidence between African Americans and whites? How important is this gene in comparison to other modifiable uh, risk factors? Um, so other questions are, are APOL1 risk variants more susceptible to known kidney injury agents? Uh, do APOL1 variants alter response to an environmental factor or to treatment? And I think most importantly, does knowing APOL1 risk status lead to better outcomes? What can be done? Is better blood pressure control, diabetes, avoidance and nephrotoxins, less acid diets? Would that, would that help in such individuals? And there are lots of controversies about the decision to be a live kidney donor and donor outcomes, an ethical issue uh, of great Im import. What about the mechanism? Well, APOL1 has an endogenous function. Uh, does APOL1 have an endogenous function in the podocyte that's necessary to resist environmental stress and maintain podocyte health? Um, and the path, could the pathways be dysregulated in the presence of two risk variants where clinical disease manifests with the introduction of environmental stress? Could there be gene-gene interactions? That may explain uh, that, there, you know, there could be modifier loci that explain the difference between different kidney uh, pathologies. And then gene-environment interactions, so-called second hits. Um, could it be viruses or antiviral pathway that might explain the, the gaps that we see in lifetime risks with individuals with the same genetic uh, background. 
Uh, what about is APO1? Is the risk does the risk come from circulating APOL1 or APOL1 expressed in the kidney? Uh, is this apoptosis as a as a mechanism uh, in uh, podocytes? Lots of lots of information. Right? I think these kinds of studies illustrate. Um, how we can learn from research in diverse race and ethnic groups. And this recent study that I did with my colleague, um, or at least a thought piece with uh, uh, Stevan Bouchard, uh, illustrates that. You know, in breast cancer, we've been able to show differences in Native American ancestry at the estrogen receptor locus led to discovery of a genetic variant that was protective against breast cancer in Latinas. In heart failure, we know the, the, the data about fixed dose combinations of hydrolyzine and uh, isosorbate dinitrate uh, suggested that blacks but not whites had a significant reduction in mortality. Uh, the increased preterm birth rate due to endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals, it's more common among uh, minorities. Uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, kidney disease, as I mentioned, and then response to antiretroviral uh, uh, agents uh, that may be due to uh, differences in genetic polymorphisms uh, in the cytochrome uh, pathway. So these are the kinds of insights I think that diversity is teaching us about. What about, I want to talk a little bit about downstream. Um, where I did a lot of my early work in quality and adequacy of CKD care. Um, and this data came also from the CHOICE study where we uh, looked at in, uh, in our cohort the timing of specialist evaluation in chronic kidney disease and mortality. And what we found is that over one-third of black dialysis patients prior to ESRD received a late evaluation by a nephrologist. So this is white males, 25% uh, um, uh, received a late evaluation, but 45% of black males received a late evaluation, 38% of black females and 30% white uh, females. Um, and in fact, others have, have shown uh, as well as us, that when you have a late evaluation, you're really poorly prepared for dialysis. Uh, your uh, nutritional status is reflected by serum albumin, uh, is, is worse uh, when you have a late evaluation, your hematocrit is lower, and you're less likely to get therapy for, uh, for anemia. This is shown in a variety of, of, of studies now. Um, and I think what was remarkable is that when we looked at whether you had an early, uh, intermediate, or late evaluation, among African Americans, having a late evaluation was seven times higher risk of mortality uh, with uh, ESRD. Um, so why is this important? Because um, poorly prepared patients miss opportunities to make informed treatment decisions, uh, treatments about hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis and transplant. We saw that in the patient that I presented uh, who was, I like to say, found in the emergency room rather than prepared for, uh, for, for ESRD. Um, and choice of therapy matters. Um, the risk of uh, death for hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis in the first year is equivalent. And hemodialysis, but hemodialysis may lead uh, better long-term outcomes, more frequent dialysis at home may be better, and self-care modalities enhance quality of life. And transplants yield better length and quality of life, as I showed you earlier. Live donor transplants are better, and preemptive transplants even uh, better. And African Americans versus whites are less likely to be waitlisted and transplanted. They're less likely to receive live kidney transplants, less likely to have knowledge of kidney replacement therapies, less knowledge of transplant prior to a dialysis initiation. They have lower health literacy, and health literacy has been associated with transplantation. And they're less knowledgeable when being evaluated for a transplant, uh, even when knowledge is accounted for race differences. When, well, when knowledge is accounted 
for race differences in transplant uh, evaporate. So let me summarize. I know that's a lot of information. Um, what I tried to show you was illustrate the African-American patient with late presentation for care who had poor preparation for ESRD and had urgent hemodialysis initiation. And treating disease at end stage is costly both personally and financially and limits access to optional therapies. And that biologic, socioeconomic, behavioral, and clinical determinants conspire to compromise health and health care uh, for minorities. And we need to develop and rigorously test interventions to address uh, determinants to human health and learn how to preempt illness through molecular knowledge, through therapeutics, and behavioral interventions. And disparities research allows the examination of these complex interactions that contribute often unequally to health for different diseases. And so a growing proportion of Americans are not fully benefiting from clinical and biomedical advances since racial and ethnic minorities make up 40% of the United States population. And most physicians and scientists, uh, including myself, are informed by research that are, is extrapolated from a largely homogeneous population. And ignoring diversity of the U.S. population is a missed scientific opportunity to understand factors that lead to disease or health. And U.S. biomedical research and steady populations must better reflect the country's changing demographics. So that's my premise, that science on disparities, clinical care with diverse patients, and education about disparities enhances all of medicine and human health. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for the Heckler Report issued by your department uh, some 30 years ago that got us on this journey. Well, thanks, Neil, for that great talk. I would point out that uh, actually this uh, is uh, very timely. March is actually National Kidney Month, and uh, on March the 11th is World Kidney Day. So this is a very uh, timely talk in this series. The only problem with that is Marva would have given me heckle for that because it's devoted to children. I was going to say uh, that. The theme this <laughs> year is me. kidney disease in children. Right. And I didn't say anything about kidney <laughs> children. <laughs> All right. But we have time for some questions if there are some. Uh, thank you, Neil. That was not only a lovely talk, but it was an extremely important talk, I think. Um, I have a uh, observation and a question. So the observation is that over the last probably decade, I've become increasingly uh, interested in the prenatal environment and perinatal environment and the idea of malnutrition, poverty, uh, maternal fetal uh, dysfunction in setting up the idea of lower nephron number which may be differentially expressed in different populations. And I think that's a very important consequence because CKD may actually start shortly after birth or at birth. So I, I think that should be added to your very beautiful presentation. I agree. It's a, it's a wonderful area. It's really been understudied. And for a variety of reasons, it, it, it's very hard to get information like that on a large number of individuals to look at this. But certainly an intriguing area, again, an area that, that brings together both biology and environmental factors, right. uh, some of which I try to allude to. So right. thank you. That's right. very important, I think, area for future discovery. Epigenetics in action, sort of. Uh, but the, the question is, and I know you've probably struggled with, because I think people in the dialysis world have struggled with this for 30 years since Fritz Port's observation is that the survival in black Americans in the end-stage renal disease program on hemodialysis is superior to the uh, survival of white populations. And I've often thought that this must be associated with psychosocial factors and differential 
perceptions of quality of life or other factors associated with families. But the two questions would be, why is it in only in this population, especially out of all the chronic diseases, and we haven't really licked the issue. I think there's an important biological interactive uh, message there that we haven't been able to um, elucidate, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Right. So that yeah, that's a very interesting. What what Paul's referring to is that an African American patient who gets to ESRD has a far better survival than their white counterparts. Paradoxical. Um, so, uh, you know, I've done some work to try to look at this, and uh, what Paul's saying is that is this actually uh, um, environmental? And so she kind of, we, we've tried to done work to look at whether it's biological, whether in fact, you know, I remember several years ago I did a study to try to look at that those who actually get on to dialysis, is there selection? Maybe, you, you, maybe African Americans with more comorbidity are left behind and didn't have an opportunity for a dialysis. But that's not true in our country because Medicare uh, provided insurance for everyone to, if they develop end-stage renal disease, to get dialysis, and we actually showed that using some some data. Um, and then there's the other side, which is are more African American are African Americans less likely because they're less likely to get a transplant. Does that mean that um, in in fact? when you compare them to Caucasians, the Caucasians have more comorbid disease that were contraindications to a transplant, or at least there was some subtle, subtle uh, selective factors for people who got a transplant, meaning that the African Americans left behind may be healthier. And there's some suggestion of that, although not perfect. Um, and then the other side, which you know, I have not seen a lot of data about, is is the environment, or the environmental, or as you say, um, uh, behavioral related issues that may affect human health in your survival to be on dialysis. It's something we don't understand. Another area for uh, ripe for discovery. More research. It was a lovely talk. Thank you, Neil. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. My name is Haisa Dantas. I am a postback student and actually a prospect uh, medical student. Mm -hmm. uh, my question for you um, is, um, knowing all of this information, you know, the correlations and the factors related to certain disease and how health disparities is um, related to that, you know, as you mentioned in the end, how, for example, even though African Americans are more likely to need a transplant, they actually have more barriers um, to receiving a transplant. Um, this information, how can it actually translate into doctors actually providing better patient care? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, what's interesting is we've known a lot of this. I could have showed you a slide that showed those transplant disparities. Uh, it's been 10 years, and we have not made any difference in uh, who gets waitlisted or who gets transplanted. We tried to tinker a little with the factors in the waitlisting uh, uh, algorithm. Um, so um, you're, you're absolutely right. I think this is a failure. I think it's a failure of our profession to correct this, because um, it shouldn't be that individuals have different selective and may have to do with how we evaluate individuals for uh, uh, transplant. We also know that for living related donors, that if uh, I showed you the data that actually shows that African Americans have relatives who have uh, kidney disease, so maybe that limits the, the, the potential live kidney donors in their family or friends. Uh, and how do you factor that uh, uh, in? Um, so 
we have a, we have a lot of reflection to do, and I think even more action to turn this around. Okay. Thanks for your question. Thank you. And I would say also that thanks for the wonderful questions I had. I met with some of the trainees here today that are doing really exciting work in different laboratories throughout the uh, NIH, and it was fabulous to hear uh, all the wonderful and exciting areas that they're working in. Hi, Dr. Bell. Thank you for your interesting talk. I was wondering, um, after a diagnosis or the beginning of dialysis in patients, do you know if there's a difference in how dramatic their lifestyle uh, behavior changes after, you know, when they, in conjunction with their um, diagnosis or beginning of dialysis therapy? And if so, if that makes a difference in their survival rate? Mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're, if I got the question right, do, you know, after someone has had a serious illness, could there be differences by ethnic group in how you respond to that illness that leads to behaviors that may influence outcome? I think that's understudied. I haven't seen uh, uh, work in that area. It's a good question. Yeah, like, for example, if, you know, I know I'm going to get, uh, kidney disease, I'll probably start eating better or exercising far more. We or, do know yeah. that, yeah. And you'll get tortured yeah. to do that, too, by, you, by your doctors and your family, definitely. In fact, you, if you look at, you know, uh, smoking rates, something that my colleague Eliseo study, if you look at smoking rates in chronic kidney disease, the more severe your kidney disease gets, the less people smoke. Uh, we've looked at that in national data, so. Great. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.